And today we're with Mary and Dwayne Metcalf, who are charter members of Hope United Methodist Church, and they're going to tell us some of their memories of the early days of this church. Uh, tell me when you first heard about this Christian community that was later to become Hope Church. Go ahead. Well, we came home one day and there was a flyer on our mailbox that told that they were going to be starting a Methodist church in the area. So um, we thought about it and we went and to the Mission VA Home Model Home and we liked what was going on there. So that was it. And the first time you went was at the model home? Mm -hmm. Yes. And Dale MacArthur, I believe, was the pastor from the Parker, Parker. Church, mm -hmm. but he was doing this on a Saturday, or was it no. a Sunday afternoon? When did he, they meet? He, he would have the the early service down at Parker, and then haul it up here to um, the model home, have our service, and then haul it back to Parker for the um, later service. Uh, so they had, they had started at 8, end at 9, and we'd start at 9.30, end at roughly 10.30, and then his other service started at 11. Wow. Well, tell me who showed up at those first meetings or what the service was like. It was in the living room of a model home in Mission Viejo, and we just, uh, I think it was a model home, and we just sat on the furniture that they had, and... Um, Reverend MacArthur brought his uh, choir director with him. She played the guitar, so we sang, we had the sermon, and several families had little bitty babies that were crawling, so we'd all bring Cheerios in little cups and stuff and set them on the floor, and we'd enjoy listening to the sermon and watching the babies crawling around on the carpeted floor. <laughs> May it go from one one family to the other sampling Cheerios to see who had the best Cheerios. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe uh, Dave and Kay Pudlick had small children at that time. Stephanie had been a baby. Stephanie and our John were two of the children. They would yeah. sample the Cheerios. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how many people would be at these meetings? I don't know. I'm it thinking... It would go eight to... Uh, maybe 15 at most, um, but usually it was like 10 or 12, um, and we just uh, raised the roof and and uh, tried not to be too anxious about uh, when MacArthur was giving the sermon, uh, but we always got out of there before they opened the model home for the, <laughs> for the Sunday uh, showings. Yep. And it was very informal. Um, we did, um, one time we drove down, it was Easter Sunday of, uh, was it 74? I think 1974? Yes. That we drove down to uh, Parker Methodist Church and we, uh, we had our, our little gang um, sat in one, one section of the sanctuary and, and um, then they had the Easter service. Man, our little John had his white suit on that Mary had made for him. <laughs> and he was going around, he was just about the right height where he could stick his nose inside the bell of the Easter lilies that they and they had you know, just like every church they had tons of Easter lilies sure. spread out, and and so he was going around, and he was sticking his nose in, smelling the Easter lilies. <laughs> well, then he came running back to us with his great big smile and a yellow nose. <laughs> he had gotten all this pollen on his nose, and he had a yellow nose, and we just... Everybody in our little model home group thought that was just pretty funny. It was just very entertaining on Easter Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yes, we had, we had trouble keeping our composure during the sermon because we were all thinking of his nose. <laughs> I can see why. <laughs> it was pretty uh, cute. Also on that Easter Sunday, um, that was, it must have been 1975, 
because um, our son John was adopted from Vietnam and we'd had him for about a year and um, that Easter Sunday just right it was right at the time of the fall of Saigon it would have been yeah. 75 and I always remember that Reverend MacArthur when he was baptizing John at that service said there but for the grace of God go I Amen. when he was introducing John and I treasured that I can see why but tell me a little bit about what you remember of uh, Dale MacArthur. What was his personality like? He was very friendly. He's very big. Um, just a perfect person to be the minister at Parker Methodist and the energy to get up here every Sunday. <laughs> he was on the run. Uh -huh, absolutely. Well, how long did you meet in the model home before you decided maybe we could have a church here? I think it was maybe uh, maybe a year, if that even. And then we were told that they wanted to build the church on the other side of the dam. So um, we started meeting at Bellevue Elementary. Mm -hmm. And I believe in the June of 75, Robert Cole was actually appointed mm -hmm. to that church. Mm -hmm. And then I assume uh, Dale MacArthur sort of backed out and mm -hmm. the group that had started at the mobile home moved over to the high school or the middle school. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if all of the, all of the people moved over. I, I remember the Pudlicks and the Harris and Carolyn Houlihan and um, Gary and Mary Marie Pennywit moved over. They are all from this area where we live, but they all went over there. And I remember one meeting where we were trying to figure out a name for the church. Yes. And um, what's, her, what's his name, huh? Terry and... Dick. Dick Wells. Wells. Yeah, Terry and Dick Wells. Dick Wells wanted to, it to be called the Sunrise Church, spelled S-O-N, Rise yes. Church. And other people were not happy about that. They, we went for hope. <laughs> <laughs> Did they have but an election? Did you? Yeah, we voted. voted? Yeah, well, but we had a. There was a small group that met at uh, Reverend Cole's house, and uh, we made a recommendation for a name to the congregation um, based on uh, what we had come up with, and and I remember because a lot of us were, were driving across the uh, Cherry Creek Reservoir Road. Sure, sure. Um, I remember that uh, Reverend Cole, he was adamant about that not being one name, in, uh, or the church would not be named one thing. And that uh, since we were, since so many of us were driving across the Reservoir Road, he said there was no way that he was going to have that uh, have us call it the damn church because he did not want to be known as the damn minister. <laughs> so, he was very adamant about that. Well, I don't know what his problem was. <laughs> to me, it seemed like a real hang up, you know, a personal issue. Well, even today we call that the damn road. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, you know, that's, oh. that was sort of, that was sort of the flavor of the group. <laughs> it was just a good group of people, and we were trying to have a, a spiritual meaning, but yet we never forgot to have a little fun. That's terrific. And uh, it was, that was important. I mean, I remember when we had our girls, um, sometimes we would, we had, they were twins, and, and sometimes we would dress them alike. And we would leave them in the, in the nursery, and I would say, "Oh, don't worry, Anne has black shoes on." And I would turn and walk away. Well, of course, they both had black shoes on. <laughs> you know, and the, and the people were so relieved because then they could tell Anne apart from Amy, and then they found, you know, when I went back, well, I never went back to pick the the girls up. It was I always sent Mary because I knew they were going to be laying in wait for me. But you know, it was just. Again, just 
wanting to have a little bit of humor in our lives and um, and I think we we had a good mix of it and you know some folks there were <laughs> there were some folks that were sort of uh, straight laced but uh, uh, most everybody was you could get a smile out of them well it sounds like and that's been a hallmark I think of hope that it has a sense of humor and the, the people seem to enjoy each other I mm -hmm. noticed that the years I've been there. Mm -hmm. well, tell me about uh, Robert Cole. What do you remember about him as a pastor? Well, his hair was bushy. <laughs> <laughs> the, I think the afros were in style yeah, then because yeah. I had one for And he had a, <laughs> um, a short afro, I guess. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't know. He was. He had good sermons, and he was always open. Uh, I guess now we say, think outside the box. He was always open to new ideas, and uh, when we um, when we started, we uh, Mary wanted to do something um, not just with the, the church, and so uh, she became the social concerns committee. And she did not like the idea that she would just do, uh, they, they thought that social concerns was just running around doing uh, uh, raffles and, and raising money for, for little projects around the neighborhood. And Mary had a little different uh, mindset and, and thought that it should be, we should be concerned about some of the issues and how can we help. And. Reverend Cole, he was he was all for that. He he wanted mm -hmm. to do what he could and and what how he could help and everything and and so we uh, there were four families that uh, suckered in to uh, um, sponsor a, a Vietnamese refugee family in uh, 75 76 and. We had no idea what we were getting into. But you and Mary were one of those families. We were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Pudlicks and uh, the Coles. And the Harris. Harris. Yeah. And um, it was a mother, a grandmother, and six kids. And that was, <laughs> we just didn't know what we were what we were getting into. We, we, of course, obviously since then uh, we were able to, through the Red Cross, locate the father and the grandfather and reunite the family. And um, we have attended weddings and unfor graduations, weddings, and unfortunately funerals. And uh, we still are in contact. Um, we used to get together uh, here um, around the holidays. Uh, the family is very devout Catholic, and their second oldest boy is uh, a priest, and uh, so we, uh, anyway, we would, we'd have fun, and, and uh, they have quite a love of music, and we just, we enjoyed their, their spirit. I mean, you, you think about, because the family was refugee twice. They were from North Vietnam, and when the communists took over, they moved south. And then, when the communists were taking over, they were the mother and grandmother and six kids were um, part of the boat people that came over. And father and grandfather stayed back because there wasn't room, and so they uh, they stayed back. And then, as I say, we were fortunate enough to reunite the family and then all of a sudden there were eight kids. Uh, <laughs> That's an incredible so. story to, after all of the tumult in their lives to be reunited. Mm -hmm. well, did you exactly. have trouble convincing the church to do this? That's a good question. Um, I was at one of the board meetings and I was social concerns committee and I said well I think we should sponsor a refugee family. And this one guy said, social concerns, you need to do potlucks. And I said, then you've got the wrong person. I don't do potlucks. 
<laughs> oh, I'll, I'll take some to pilot, but <laughs> I'm worried about these people from you, Vietnam. You had a bigger vision than yes, that. Yes, yes. <laughs> so um, we did all the preliminary work and all, and they said, we want people that are going to work. We don't want a family that's going to be on welfare. And I said, absolutely, I don't either. Well, at that time, we were a young church. We are just getting started, and so we were among the last to volunteer to sponsor a family. And um, we got a call through Catholic Charities, and they said, we have one family. We can't find anybody for them, and the camp is almost empty. We don't have many people left that need sponsors, but it's a mother, grandmother, and six children. And I thought, oh, that's going to be hard. <laughs> so we took it to the administrative board, and they said, okay, we'll just come together and do this. And I remember, um, I, was it you that suggested we get beds for them at an army surplus store? Bunk, bunk beds, yeah. We got an apartment up by Stapleton Airport, and it was a two-bedroom apartment for eight people. So we had the boys' room and the girls' room. Each room had two sets of bunk beds. And um, I went in there. I, I used to go over a lot just to make sure everything was okay and all. Well, they had a baby, an infant. And we got someone had donated a crib for the baby. So I went over and I noticed the crib wasn't up, but there was a hammock strung between two of the bunk beds and the girls' room. So what they do with the baby, they put her in the hammock, turn it around so that she couldn't fall out, and she was perfectly safe. And that was great. And one time I was over there and the baby was in there crying and one of the boys went in and kicked one of the bunk beds so the hammock rocked back and forth and the baby stopped crying. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> but I, I love wow. that cultural thing of keeping babies safe. Another time, the grandmother, she was, she was in her 60s, and she was peeling potatoes. She was squatting down, which is, they do that a lot in Vietnam. She was squatting down, peeling the potatoes on the floor. And I said, I, I just took her hands, and I took the potato, and the, I showed her how to peel it into the sink. And she nodded and squatted down and kept peeling it on the floor. <laughs> so we learned a lot. <laughs> well, I assume you would agree with Wayne, Dwayne, that that's been a real blessing in your family to know this Absolutely. family over the last 40 years. Absolutely. They, we treasure them. Their values are our values and about family and just being good people. They're wonderful. The kids have all done very well. They have two doctors in the family, a doctor of pharmacology and a doctor of optometry. It's a priest. A priest, two engineers. Musician. Yeah, one does, um, I'm not sure what it is. He makes CDs of music. Well, piano. And piano. Yeah, oh yeah, he's composed yeah. his own and music in fact, too. We, we shared part of the CD, well, one of the songs that he and this other um, Vietnamese priest had composed and played, um, we shared that um, at one of the services a while back when somebody thought I should talk about stewardship. That so was really I, nice that you did that. But, uh, you know, we've been totally blessed with, with that family, they're, they're just wonderful people and they, they've been so accepting. Uh, we always are at the Tet Celebration, which is the Vietnamese New Year, and they just, they make sure that, you know, they don't just invite us, they make sure that we are taken care of. And uh, not necessarily the well, just an example, um, the father had passed away, and uh, it was his 100-day anniversary, which in the Catholic um, Church is significant. You have another ceremony. Um, 
and um, I was I was there and we I was sort of walking around the back of the church just trying to be inconspicuous um, and all of a sudden an arm or a hand grabs my arm and starts pulling me well it was this short 70 pound mother good old Kim she wasn't about to have me in the back she pulled me right up by the in the front and she sat me down <laughs> in one of the front pews um, to uh, let folks know that we were there and we were accepted. You're part of that family. Mm -hmm. That's a terrific story. And to, to sort of tie Bob Cole in with the family, <laughs> he had them at one of the services, uh, we brought them to the service. This was at Bellevue Elementary. And uh, and of course it was a little, you know, they were a little like like fish out of water. Of course. They had no <laughs> idea what was going on and and um, anyway they were there and after the service uh, they were they were introduced and after the service the grandmother was walking amongst the congregation and she had this wad of Vietnamese money and she was she would peel off a couple of the bills and she'd hand it to someone say souvenir <laughs> now, her her English was you know hello thank you goodbye and souvenir <laughs> <laughs> but she was pass she knew the money was worthless but she was passing it out to give and I guess that's what I guess that's what we would take away from that entire experience. It's just how much they would give. Well, you gave a lot to them, but it seemed like they took that opportunity and made the best of it. They did. Suzanne Harif and I um, took them to a yellow front store up on Colfax so that the three, the, I think it was the three oldest kids, so we could get them school clothes. And we had a shopping cart, and we thought, okay, they need five outfits each to go to school. So we were holding things up to them and throwing them in the cart, and throwing it in the cart. And the oldest girl, Tweed, she finally goes, too much, too much. And she starts putting some of it back. Oh. And I realized maybe two outfits would be plenty. And we thought, well, you got to wash them and stuff. Well, I guess they washed every day. But I think they walked out of the yellow front store with a few more outfits than they'd ever had before. It sounds like <laughs> it. Well, yes. Well, <clears throat> tell me what you remember about the meetings at the school. Bob Cole was the pastor, and he had more people show mm -hmm. up. Did they have a piano or a choir? Or? Well, Barb Lair, I think she started the choir there, and I think she also started the youth group. I'm not sure about that, but um, gosh, I, we had we had gotten our twins, our, our twin girls are adopted from the Philippines, and I think we were just so busy with them that sure. it's hard to remember that part. <laughs> uh, um, Three kids all of a sudden. The um, Olsons, Karen Olson, Karen and Dick. Um, Karen was the head of, or headed up the uh, Christian education and oh, Sunday that's school. Right. I had forgotten. That. And um, they had a uh, little girl, Lisa, I believe. And um, so somehow they roped me into teaching fourth and fifth grade kids. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so I was there. Karen was overseeing my actions, and I was there for, um, I don't know, three or four years, um, having a good time teaching the kids. Well, both of your names show up in the record books of Hope, holding various positions. I believe you were the chairman of the administrative board, and you taught a mm -hmm. Sunday school class. And you're on the social concerns committee, Mary, mm -hmm. and other things mm -hmm. that you did. You remember? Um, 
I remember that Cape Hudley and I, now this was after we got a building, but we did the uh, um, vacation Bible school. And I remember the first day of vacation Bible school, the electricity went out in the church. And we were down in the basement and we were scrambling around. He said, oh, I'll get it. And I thought I knew where the, the um, electrical box was. And I went where I thought it was, and it wasn't there. And, <laughs> okay, I don't know where it is. <laughs> I don't, did she remember that? Uh, no. I haven't talked to her yet. Oh, so you we'll, haven't? We'll oh, see. okay. Well, we moved yeah. into the new building in February of 79, which is now the Schult Fellowship Hall, but that was the original building of Hope mm -hmm. at the corner of Bellevue and Dayton. You remember moving in there? Mm-hmm. There were a lot of issues with flooding. <laughs> the parking lot, Shirley Hall said, was a mess. Yeah, it was. That there was a lot of uh, ancillary issues with just getting into that new church. Tell me what you remember. The thing that I remember, Dwayne came home from an administrative council one time, and he said, this is such good news, that one of the members had a, a brick company, and he donated all the brick. Oh, to really? build for that yeah. first building. I didn't know that. Yeah. I can't remember the name of the company, but and when they built the additions, the, the brick matches perfectly, no, which is nice. Robinson brick. Okay. And he, it was quite something. Mm -hmm. One thing I remember, we were at, as part of the, since I was uh, part of the administrative board we had a meeting down at the district office with the uh, powers that be and Steve Hole was there and, and of course Bob Cole and other members um, and Steve his um, life his, his his professional life was involved in building he was a uh, sort of acting as a, a non-official general contractor of the church, getting things going and ta telling us what kind of problems we might run into or what what opportunities we should take advantage of and different things. Anyway, I just remember that I was sitting there at this meeting and I was thinking, how in the world are we going to find people to fill this building? Because we're going to need to start paying for it. And uh, I was thinking about that and then here uh, Dick was or uh, Steve Hull was was talking about uh, um, the parking lot and how to grade the parking lot and and things like that and and it was just um, gee it is sort of important we, we should think about those things to keep people uh, so they're not coming in a mud bath to walk through and then go to church, but um, I guess that'd be a new meaning for washing one's feet. <laughs> anyway, it, it was just different perspectives, and it just seemed um, with divine intervention that when we needed something, it appeared, or it was handled, and uh, we, we were fortunate uh, that we had a lot of help. Well, one of those persons seems to have been uh, Victor Schult, that he came about this time, mm -hmm. and I believe had been retired, mm -hmm. but came out of retirement to serve at Hope. Uh, tell me what you remember about Victor Schult. I think, Charlie, that's about the time when they wanted us to start over at Smoky Hill, and I, I, I know him, but... Um, our... I, con our Contact with him was somewhat limited because, yeah, yeah, we we were moving over to Smoky Hill, and um, and you were asked to move over there to help establish this new church. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Right. So we're yeah. charter members of Smoky Hill Church too. <laughs> what about Al Brown? Do you remember Al Brown, or are you associated with him some? I remember him, just the name and all. I remember, <laughs> what I remember is I was on the Pastor Parish Relations Committee at that time, and th 
through some uh, cranky members, the district allowed us to uh, have a voice in, in who our minister would be. Usually they just said, here, you know, congratulations, here's your new minister. But uh, since there were uh, uh, some not too pleasant members, they, they acquiesced and gave us an opportunity to, to talk to, to two or three candidates and then at least have our opinion shared with them. And uh, so I remember talking with uh, Reverend Brown and, and uh, then um, I, well, my, my connection with him more was when um, at, during this time, um, not, not being able to learn from the past, my wife and I sponsored a uh, Polish refugee couple. <laughs> um, it, was, it was in the early 80s and Poland was, was going through a revolution and a lot of people left, left Poland and, and were trying to, to go elsewhere uh, for a better life, safer life. And so we, uh, we said, sure, we know all about that. We're, we're seasoned veterans, and so we said, sure, we'll take, a, uh, take someone. Well, it turned out to be this young couple. Uh, she was, I think she was 21, he was 19, or reverse, and uh, they had met in the refugee camp um, and gotten married. And uh, so we said, sure. Uh, they uh, were, were learning English, they knew uh, uh, Polish and, and German, and I knew a little bit of German. Um, Not enough. <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> we we had quite a time. They, in that case, they they lived with us. They they lived in our house, and uh, for two months. So they they had uh, uh, I finished the basement um, of that house and and. We had put bedrooms down there, so they stayed in the basement, and they had a bathroom, and we had all eat together, and it worked well. Um, he was a, a track star, and she was a concert pianist. Wow. And so, uh, do you know what it's like to have uh, the piano played in your house for five or six hours with nothing repeated? <laughs> um, you know, the... I it sounds to... really neat, and uh, and the first couple days was, <laughs> but as you might imagine, I had to take a lot of walks. I can imagine. <laughs> I oh. love classical music, um. but whoa! <laughs> and then it, it, think... it was well. She she wanted to make a meal for us, and here again, culture comes in because. You have no idea what we have here in the U.S. I believe Brad Pitt said that if you were born in the United States, you won the birth lottery. And mm -hmm. we have no idea what it's like. And, and I, she said that, I, that she wanted to cook a meal for us. And so I said, fine. And I took her to the good old King Supers. And it was... My positioning was by accident, but it was a good thing I was standing right behind her because when we walked in, the poor girl almost fell over. Uh, she was just so overwhelmed with the size. And I said, okay, what, what do you want to get? And she said, well, we get some meat. And so we went to the meat counter and she was, her eyes were just saucer wide. She looking at this and, and finally she said, well, where is the line? Uh, I said, what do you mean? Uh, the line for the meat. And he said, there is no line, just, you know, look at the counter, look at the display, and what do you want? And she was looking, and finally, then she said, well, how much can we get? Was our portion? And I, I uttered, I think it was something she just didn't understand. I said, how much do you want? And 
she had a hard time understanding that we didn't have to buy just this little ration. Right. We could buy the whole cow if we wanted it. And it was very interesting being with her that time. Anyway, we, they, she did put together a, a stew and she turned it on high, set the pan on the stove and went downstairs and came back up two hours later. Good thing I was there. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> We, we we did intervene and we did turn it down. <laughs> she was 21. She lived with her mom. She didn't know how to cook. Uh, <laughs> she and, didn't know uh, how to do laundry either. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, their marriage didn't last. They had two little girls and uh, she she works at uh, St. Joseph in the records and he went back to Poland to be with his mother. Hmm. But she... Um, she was the pianist. This was when we were at Smoky Hill. We yeah. sponsored them at Smoky Hill, and she was the pianist for Smoky Hill wow. for a while. And mm -hmm. where I was going with Al Brown was he was a minister at, at Hope during this time, and we got them a, a part-time job of, of performing janitorial duties in the church. And so I would uh, either pick them, usually I would pick, pick them up and... Um, Al was there, and we'd chit chat and so forth. And, and, uh, but it was that was, you know, yeah, we know all about that. We can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me about your experience of coming back to Hope after you had been a member at uh, Smoky Hill for a few years. Well, um, I had just retired from teaching, and all of a sudden, we found that we were the legal guardians of our two grandsons, Michael and Kyle, and we hadn't gone to Smoky Hill for a while, and um, we thought, well, we'd like to find a church for them, and so we went to, we, our first church that we went to was Hope, and um, we found out that Maestro Bob was starting a children's choir. He hadn't been there very long, and we thought that would be nice for Michael, so Michael joined the choir, and Kate Stapleton had her daughters there. I think it was just the two of us with our children, and then I know Dana Stevens, she started bringing her children, and um, they just had a lot of fun in choir, and the next thing we know, Kate Stapleton is the director of Christian Education, and you couldn't ask for a better director of Christian education or a better director for children's choir. So we stayed. Just had to go one place and that was it. Yeah. And <laughs> Michael and Kyle grew up essentially in Hope mm -hmm. Church. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Kyle was 18 months when he came and Michael was um, in first grade. He was six. Yeah. So. Well, you talked about a lot of things in your experience with Hope and Smoky Hill over the last uh, 42 years. Tell me a little bit about what Hope Church has meant to you and your family. I think it's it just feels like family in the um, model home. It was just a nice, comfortable feeling and sense of family. And the same thing with Hope now. Now that we've gone back, there's just it was wonderful to see Kate Pudlick when we went back there with the boys and um, just a comfortable, wonderful, good place for us to be. Yeah. I think one word that would come to me is acceptance, um, not only of us, um, but um, because obviously our family has never been uh, along with the mainstream uh, with our adopted children being of different nationalities and then all of a sudden we're grandparents raising grandsons but the acceptance of ideas and, and not shutting anything down just because it well we haven't done that before or that 
I don't understand it, that's too new, whatever, it, it, there's never been, I don't think in, in our experience, a time when a decision was made based on, we just don't, we haven't done that, so we're not going to. Yes. It's always been, well, let's give it a shot, let's try it, and, and the acceptance, I think, is, is one thing that makes a, a church stand out because so many churches can fall into a pattern and well okay now it's you know whatever season it is uh, this is what we're going to do and they just get into a routine and, and hope has has done so many different things and and supported so many different programs um, like the work clothes and the work boots um, things like that for for folks down on their luck um, you know, it's just great yeah. accepting new ideas and new new thoughts and new new challenges. Well, that ties in a little bit with uh, one of my last questions, and that is, what would you like to see from Hope over the next forty-two years? I'd like to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I think just the programs, like I'm in the I sew for the baby layettes. And I just think it's important to keep reaching out to everyone, to our country, our state, and all but our world. I think it's very important to me that we don't have borders, that we're all in this together on this planet. And keep reaching out. Thank you. Oh, and one thing I'd like to say about Kate. I had never seen a children's Christmas pageant where there was a turtle and a cheetah. Okay. But Kyle was thrilled with his turtle costume made by Stacy and Papa. <laughs> and Michael was thrilled to be a cheetah and he was there at the edge of the stage. <laughs> <laughs> to people in Those the congregation. Those are traditional Christmas characters. <laughs> well, not exactly, no. <laughs> I think that, to be quite honest, I think the only place that Kate has stopped is that we have never had a female Joseph or a male Mary. But they, they might be asking. You never know. You never That's know. That's true. But we have had male and female wise men, and who cares about three, we've had <laughs> <laughs> 10 or 12 many. wise men. <laughs> you know, we have to sing that song, uh, you know, uh, um, had to sing the, the wise man song several times can... to get them all the way through, <laughs> you know, to get all the wise men down there. Uh, and our, our Kyle, one year, he was a camel. He wanted to be a camel, so I made him this little rug thing to put over him and ears or something. And then I, I found these green sequins, so I made kind of a harness for him. And they were putting makeup on the kids getting ready for the pageant. And he said to this lady that was putting makeup on, you know why I have these reins? No, why? So I don't spit. <laughs> <laughs> You never oh, know. That's true. <laughs> Are there any other memories or things that you can recall about your affiliation with Hope over the last 42 years? Oh, I'm sure there are. We um, could probably go on and on and on, Charlie. At first I was afraid we wouldn't have enough to say, but... <laughs> we've, been, we've been fortunate and, and um, the people of Hope have been supportive of some of the new ideas, different ideas, and um, I think we're just uh, we're just grateful that uh, we've been part of it that for whatever reason that it's uh, been an opportunity that we've we've enjoyed and and uh, have gotten more out of than we've put in to, but. Uh, well, that's refreshing to hear because you've certainly put in a lot as mm -hmm. charter members of two different churches that started in this area and then your affiliation with Hope all these years. It's been good. I guess if there was something we could do, 
when I was at Smoky or when we were at Smoky Hill, um, there was an adult Sunday school class that I mm -hmm. uh, coordinated for about four or five years. It's called Grounds for Discussion, and we would just talk. We would we had our own curriculum. Uh, we whatever subjects were uh, uh, in the news, um, whatever we want we wanted to talk about, we would just chat and. and uh, I would try and kick off the discussion, uh, but it was mainly just uh, you expressing your opinion, and, and our rules were everyone has an opinion, and every opinion is of value. And, uh, we agree to disagree, is yeah. what we said. And so we, you know, that I don't know as if there is a spot for a class like that here at uh, Hope in the because it seems like there's a lot of, lot of uh, classes being offered for the adults and no need to, to muck up the water with another one, but um, that was always fun and uh, it was enjoyable and, you know, sometimes um, there were a couple times where I was guided to to have a, a discussion that someone in the class just needed. Yes. And uh, there again, just fortunate to, if something like that would ever be available or, or anybody would think it was worthwhile, we would probably help out however I could. Dwayne did a wonderful job with that, and we would have a, a big crowd. It was like 28 or 30, 32 people there on a Sunday. It was, people really did enjoy it. <clears throat> well, given the overall climate of our society and politics, that's a good place, I think, to have those discussions, that if you can come to the church and be mm -hmm. able to respect other people's opinion mm -hmm. and yet still have an overlay of your Christian faith, mm -hmm. that's a good thing. Yeah, we, I mean, we had all sorts of we always talked about religion or different religions. Every year, we would we would spend a few weeks on like the Native American religions, um, Jehovah's Witness, uh, the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. I even, um, as a CPA, my practice included one of the the second largest metaphysical stores metaphysical stores here in Denver, <laughs> and I even had a uh, Witch, white, white witch, not black witch, but a, a white witch come and talk and tell us about their beliefs and their, you know, how their ceremony works and everything. And, and uh, you know, because the one guiding principle I had is that um, we are afraid of what we don't know, so knowledge will set us um, on a path that we can understand. So if we learn about it, um, that's always, I think, always good. I, I never realized what the, the deal was with the brooms and the witches, uh, but I was, yeah, when this witch was talking, they uh, take the broom and they sweep away all the bad spirits from the altar. And so that's why a broom is important to them. It, it uh, gets rid of the bad spirits. Well, you know, hmm. that's not a bad thing. That's, that's a good thing. And, and le just learning, just knowledge is, is a, that was it's always great to learn because there's so many things we don't know. Yep. I think sometimes the minister was kind of wondering what was going on in that class, <laughs> especially after what Dwayne just talked oh. about. But um, we've met, we've come across those people in recent years, you know, and they've always said how much they enjoyed that class sure. that Dwayne did. And when the Sistine Chapel was being refurbished, um, we had some classes, Sunday school classes about that. Yeah, you we know, it was just new things in the news and sure. other religions and all. Art. Um, <coughs> we had uh, guest speakers. Uh, we had, a, you know, art uh, 
and religion, and then we also had uh, the general manager of PBS came and, and talked to us. That was really good. Uh, we had um, elected Mike. officials, Mike Kaufman, he came and talked about different things, and, and uh, it was just a... I think, though, the crowning glory was when we had a Masidic Jew come and talk to us about... Uh, Hasidic, Hasidic no, Jew? No. Oh, Masidic. No, this is a I'm Masidic sorry. Jew that okay. they believe in Christ. Um, Hasidic or okay. ultra-conservative, but the Masidic Jew, and I might be mispronouncing that, but uh, they, they believe in Christ and they, they accept the Torah, but they have added that Christ wasn't just a, a prophet, uh, so to speak. Anyway, um, in their service, they, uh, they believed in uh, the blowing of the ram's horn, and when that old boy pulled out that ram's horn and cut loose, <laughs> he was about three quarters of the way through the sermon, I've been told, and no one realized what was happening. And we were I, in the basement. The sanctuary was above. Yes, I was. I was told that people were ducking for cover. Um, you know, no one really. They, you know, some were were uh, saying, "Well, I should have been better because second coming is here." <laughs> but he really wailed on that thing, and everybody knew what he was doing. But I think that's when the ministers started wondering. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on down there? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh. Any other thoughts or ideas come to mind? I think yeah. that's good. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your time and certainly for your contributions to Hope and Smoky Hill and having an open mind about so many things. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charlie, for all the memories that you are recording for everyone at that church. It's wonderful. Well, for everything that pictures. you've done. You're yes. welcome. That's my pleasure. <laughs>